Thank you, Alessandra, very much for the invitation. Thank you to the entire group of Europeana Fashion. So I'm very pleased and honored that you still have the energy to stay after a long day. And we have had amazing uh, talks and lectures. We have seen so many images, and I am sure your heads are already full of images and everything. So I hope that you still keep on for, our, for Maria and me. Um, hopefully, you will learn a little bit also. First of all, I would say, like to say that my talk could also have entered in the morning session. So the GLAM community, we are part of it. We are a library, an archive, and a museum at the same time, which is quite rare. And hopefully, you will understand more about this con construction after my talk. So it's a very special situation. Uh, I will come back to the strange title of my talk later. So the title is One to 250,000 uh, Fashion image, Images Tell Histories or Stories. My institution is uh, part of a bigger institution, which is part of Europeana Fashion Project. So I'm very happy that my colleagues from the Institut für Museumsforschung in Berlin are here with me. Our institution is called the Stiftung Preußischer Kulturbesitz, Foundation of the Prussian Cultural Heritage. So it doesn't only sound quite traditional, but it is. And you will see that we are only going small steps from the past to the future. But I'm convinced that it's better to go step by step than falling into the future without knowing what to do. What we as a German partner in this project hopefully can provide is also a big thing of history. Many of you will not know or not remember that in Germany, the German uh, industry has, let's say, founded something you would call ready to wear already in the 1830s. So more than 180 years back from now. So what we are living today, the maybe phenomenon called mass moda, has really old roots which have been made in the Berlin fashion industry. And I will try to look with you back to one of our big periods, which was the 1920s period in the Berlin fashion industry. So my focus is very different from what has been done before. Um, I decided to go from a very broad panorama to one single object, and maybe you understand already my one part of my title. So let's start with uh, the uh, panorama view of uh, our uh, institution in Berlin. The National Museums in Berlin, which are part of the foundation of the cultural heritage, Prussian, how is it in, in real English? Foundation of the Prussian heri cultural heritage. I'm not used to use this long word. So the National Museums do have four sites for uh, places in Berlin. We are placed at the so-called Kulturforum, which is uh, easy to be understood by everybody, with four museums in total. My institution is called the Kunstbibliothek, to make it even more complicated, which is art library in English. And you see on the image, uh, well, uh, our building. In this building, there are again two other ins two institutions, the Prince and Drawings Room, which is a museum on its own, and the Kunstbibliothek, which is a library the biggest German art library and a museum at the same time. So this is the general st structure of the museums. It's 16 museums in total. Within the Kunstbibliothek, again, we have six museum departments, and my department, the Costume Library, is only one of these. We have uh, graphic collections specializing on architectural design and drawings. We have a very famous ornamental print collection very influential also for um, people working in the creative industries. We have a very old and important graphic design collection with poster art from France and all the countries. An important photography department, one of the first ones in the German Museum. We have a good department of rare books and artist books. And last but not least, the Lipperheide Costume Library. So all these graphic collections, as you might know, are hidden treasures as textile 
graphic art on paper cannot be shown on a permanent basis, otherwise it would vanish too quickly. So we have to keep all our treasures in our study rooms and only showing temporary exhibitions with all of them. And I am very sure that the new digital uh, possibilities today will give us new opportunities to find a new public, to show more what we have, and I'm very sure that this will help us also to get a new public. So, why Lipperheide Costume Library? Here now you see uh, Franz von Lipperheide. I would very much like to introduce you to him. Um, he has been a book and magazine editor and specializing in fashion magazines in the 19th century in Berlin. It was a very logical thing as the industries have been so strong we also have had kind of an important fashion magazine production with big publishing houses in uh, Berlin. So he himself was trained as a librarian, had a big knowledge of uh, rare books, of culture, cultural history. His wife was, uh, we would today say, the chief editor of the famous Die Modenwelt. This was the name of their fashion magazine. It was founded approximately in the years of the founding of foundation of Harper's Bazaar, so in 1865. And the couple of uh, Franz and Frieda, his wife was first name is Frieda, they made a fortune with this fashion magazine, Die Modenwelt, which was translated in 15 languages at the time. They had a Brazilian edition, they had French editions, Italian editions, Nor uh, Nordic editions, a Russian one, and all parted from the Berlin edition, which was then only translated in the other languages. Um, the images remained all the same, it was woodcuts at the time, so this was really a worldwide enterprise, maybe like Condé Nast for a few decades later. Wife Frida made, has also built up a collection, and it's uh, very typical, I would say. She has built up the textile and costume collection, and her husband has built up a very huge collection on graphic art, books, magazine, paintings, and so on. As she died earlier than her husband, his first thing after her death was to sell her collection in auction. My theory is he wanted to remain the only one who had a big collection, so he donated his collection in 1899 to the then Royal Museums of Berlin, and he asked for three things, that the collection keeps his name, so this is why we are called until today, Lipperheide Costume Library. He wanted a public use, which we also have until today, you will immediately see the study rooms, and also to continue the collection without alas, leaving money to us, but we had to continue the collections. As I said, Berlin at this time was really the top center in Europe for ready-to-wear. Paris was always a couture center, and Berlin in the 1880s, especially after the Prussian-French um, war, made a fortune of money with ready-to-wear um, garments. So, until today, uh, the Lipperheide Costume Library is worldwide the most important graphic collection and specializing library on the cultural history of dress and fashion. I am stressing the word dress too because Lipperheide had a very broad vision about uh, dress culture, garment culture. You are all very, warm very warmly invited to come to Berlin, to come to our study room and to see what we can offer for your research. It's clear that not only we are accepting visitors in the study rooms, I'm also, I'm also preparing uh, yearly, once a year, an exhibition. I will come back to this later. I've published quite a lot of books too, so I'm since 23 years now in this collection and with a year, yearly rhythm you can imagine how much has been published. We have a lecture series also which was, uh, which was also funded internationally so I could invite some of the speakers also here in the room to come to Berlin to present their research uh, just a few years ago. I will first concentrate for a second on our book and magazine collection. So Lippe Heides, uh, and you see some new acquisitions here. We have about 25,000 monographs today. You see they are dated from the very early beginnings of book printing. These are not costume books. The very first books are Bibles and other historical classical texts which had illustrations which showed us the taste 
of the period, so the last, uh, late 15th century depictions, how they thought that, for instance, bi um, uh, biblic scenes could have been taken, could have been looked like. So this is why Lippe Heide also collected books from this period and it's going up to, to now. So we have about 500 new acquisitions a year. His legacy is a very complex um, catalog system with more than 120 topics where we can file the new arriving books. So for instance here we could go to um, the, the underwear book could go in the, in the group of underwear. We have Egypt, we have a French 20th century, we have the fashion and dress uh, history of, US, of the US. We have also books on festivities. So you can see a little bit what, what is on this screen. So, Lippe Heide covered all facets of dress history. Let it be um, court dress, um, stage design, um, accessories, military costume, folk costume fashion as such, historical um, uh, books on uh, family uh, genealogies, things like this. And I think all is important today for fashion design. We all know that other things are also important for fashion creation, but we are very lucky to have many, many young designers coming also to use our rare book and our um, historical book collections. Another famous part of the library is the magazine um, collection. It's approximately to the same number as you have had them for the book, so 25,000 volumes, and the volume can always be like one issue only if it's Vogue Italia del, uh, of the um, September issues or other Vogue's, but it can also be like 10 issues of a very small fashion magazine in one volume. And they also dated from the late 18th, 18th century to uh, the actual years. We have about 60 subscriptions, also some online some subscriptions. Only to give a few examples, uh, Vogue US or Harper's Bazaar are in our library from the very beginnings. We are only lacking the war years because Germany couldn't buy fashion magazines from the enemy. So we don't have the war years. If any, anybody has duplicates, doubles, we are, they are always welcome. We also have, for instance, the Gallery of Fashion published in London from 1794 to 1803, complete run. We have about three runs, complete runs of Gazette du Bon Ton. And we wouldn't give away our doubles from the Gazette, <laughs> we keep them. But also something like International Textiles, published in Amsterdam from 1993 onwards, with all the beautiful Gruyot covers from the 1950s and 60s. Um, I've put the link for our online catalog where all the um, magazines can be found. Unfortunately, you cannot found, find yet all the early printed books. Rare book collections are very hard to recatalogize because it's uh, kind of difficult for the librarians to do this. I forgot to tell you also in the book section we have a huge selection of travel books, so the early travels, we have a very good selection of festivity books. I think I, I told you before. There is a very good section also on caricatures, so many, many series of Daumier, of all the Gavarni, of all the French people are also Gilray, many, many caricatures are there. And Lippe Heide had a broad vision. He wasn't only a dress historian, a costume historian, he really was a cultural historian before the discipline and the word existed. So this is a very annoying image, but uh, just to start with, the graphic and photographic collections, and maybe now you have already calculated I arrived at the second part of my title, 250,000, so <laughs> it was 50,000 in the books and magazines and 200,000 items in the graphic collection. They complete the source material which we have in books and magazines. Lippe Heide had collected some 40,000 works of art, of graphic art, and we now have uh, five times more. So you see in 100 years, the collection has really grown enormously. The topics in this collection are as rich as in the library holdings. Our invent inventory is not yet completely done, and uh, with Europeana founding, Europeana fashion founding, we can also improve still our database. Um, in the 20th century, we received many big estates from fashion illustrators, from fashion houses, from fashion photographers, from any kind of collectors. The library has quite a big fame, in Europe at least, so we receive, not daily, but uh, 
quite often also offers and sometimes I have to deal to do the same as Valerie did this said this morning no we are not only your for your waste but we really select what we need now because otherwise uh, we could not uh, stay in the building where we are now for about 20 years we have also a very huge portrait collection and I think portraits are a section not enough studied today in fashion studies they are a very good, they give very good source material. We start in the 16th century with a huge portrait series and going up to the 19th century in graphic art, so in engravings, and then continuing with carte de visite and the cabinet uh, photography, and then also going on in the 20th century. They show us actual fashion worn by actual people, so I think this is even in, in past times with a certain uh, with a certain respect uh, of artistic freedom, we can say that portraits are important for fashion studies. So now I, I'm, keep, I'm leaving my broad vision and I'm giving you briefly three examples of uh, our holdings which will enter into Europeana in the data delivery. And then finally to focus on one only. So the first example are uh, fashion drawings from the Paris-based fashion house uh, Maison Bernard. We have some of their uh, albums which they made after the collections uh, between 1904 and 29. These examples which you see here are all from 1913-14. So this Maison Bernard was founded in 1905 by three guys who came from Brussels. They all have worked there for a very famous Brussels fashion house named Hirsch and Company. So they uh, separated from the mother house and founded the fashion house in Paris. They sold quite well before First World War and during First World War uh, in Europe and in the US. Their, let's say, difficult times began with the crash and then they closed in 1934. So we have been as fortunate as to uh, be able to buy some of these albums. It's uh, uh, every season, so they published let's say after the season they made a kind of record drawing for their internal um, archives and once the fashion house finishes also public institutes, institutions can, can buy things like this or get them otherwise they always stay in the um, fashion houses as we all know. We have, about, we have bought some uh, 10 um, seasons so winter and summer seasons um, on the left hand side the one they all have names as we know in haute couture the dresses have names and the left hand side is ultimatum so already in, before the first world war they had a dress called ultimatum another example which can enter uh, will enter the Euro in the european da um, fashion data is the estate of this berlin based fashion illustrator named trude rhein she was born in 1908 and she regularly went to the Paris shows in the 1960s. So we have a group of approximately 300 sketches from the Paris shows, 1960 to 1968, a very crucial period for Paris when uh, the London influence uh, got more important and especially also when the haute couture houses started to, um, to uh, invent, let's say, um, the, the Prêt-à-Porter collections just to find a new public also for their creations. At that time being, um, maybe not all of you know it, no photographer was allowed during the fashion show and no fashion illustrator was allowed. So you can now say, how did they manage to do this? So I spoke to several of our Berlin-based fashion illustrators going to Paris and uh, regularly doing the shows. They stayed inside, so they had the program with the written names and they could just write down some words. If they have been seen sketching a little detail, they would lose their permission. So they had to store everything in their optical memory. They didn't talk at the end of the show. They just ran out in the next coffee house or coffee at the corner and started to do the first sketches. And then once at home or in the hotel in the evening, they reworked these first drawings and made kind of um, synthesis uh, like you see them here on the sheet. Our uh, fashion illustrator, she was selling then finally these sketches to her Berlin clients. So when she got home to, Paris, uh, to Berlin, she had in her pockets a selection of the best 
let's say, designs of every fashion brand, and you see here, it's Capucci on the left-hand side, as you know, he was showing in Paris at that time. In the middle, it's hard to see, it's Lanvin, and on the right-hand side, it's Carda. So she, she personally selected from all she has seen, like five to ten designs, sometimes only one, and um, bought, uh, sold these designs to be recopied or to be, in, to be used as an inspiration in Berlin. So the group we have is about 300 uh, sketches of this kind, and we have got the permission of her nephew to publish them all. The third short example, especially for Nanny, is, um, Max T is a Max Tilke drawing. Many of you will know Max Tilke from his books on oriental garments and on general, general costume history. He was a very, very uh, great researcher in the beginning of the 20th century. And the Lipperheide Costume Library really owns a big, big treasure. We have about 4,000 original drawings by Max Tilke done to, for the preparation of his books. So they're very delicate drawings. Here you see a shalat from the town of Tashkent in Turkmenistan, Turkestan, sorry. He was uh, a professor for uh, fashion history at the Academy of Tbilisi in Georgia. And at this period of his life, he was traveling around all the countries, let's say, of the, of the neighborhood with his assistant, uh, Lydia, who came from Georgia. And they sketched all the dresses on the spot, talking to the peasants, talking to the people also in museums. Where many pieces he also had seen them with private collectors, so he noted every detail, how to use it, how to wear it. Sometimes you even have details on them which have never been published in the books. So this will be one of my big research projects for the next 15 years, to see, first of all, um, what everything we have, and then also to find, let's say, the surviving garments in the museum's collections, to see where the private collections have gone, which he has studied. So I think this will be also a very nice uh, work to be done. Also to show the big influence of Max Tilke on designers in the 20th century. Um, we have one among us. So now I'm focusing on my one object. This is a very iconic image which we have in our collection. It's a vintage print from uh, done before 1932. It's a small object, like one page of my paper here. We have in total about 40 vintage prints by this photographer, Eva. So maybe this is just a way now to show you how I conceive uh, the image telling, the, the storytelling by images. The uh, verso of the photograph has the stamps, so the name and the address of the photographer, also all the copyright indications, so already in the 1930s Berlin press photographers have been very um, strict in allowing uh, to use their images. You would have to pay 100 Reichsmark more if it was published without the copyright indication, so she has immediately put this here. Most of you will not know who Eva was, so this is uh, Eva. She was born in 1900 with the name Neulender. She was then an independent photographer in Berlin with various studios addresses, so we studied them. Her working focus was uh, portrait, dance and advertisement and fashion photography, as you see. She had numerous um, publications. And she uh, couldn't work during the Nazi period, so you read it here what happened, and then she was deported and probably in, in 42 assassinated at the KZ in Maidan. To add, Helmut Newton was doing his apprenticeship as a photographer in her studio from 1936 to 1938, so in the last years when, uh, and I've also put it in the, in the biography. There's been one big and good exhibition in Berlin on her, 2001, uh, and a very good first book, so in a bilingual edition, if you're interested in Eva's story, this can be a very good uh, starting point for you. Let's come back to the image. What do we see? So, you all see the legs, you see a, sh a short skirt, you see a pair of shoes. 
What you do not see, but what I can tell you, there are pencil traces in this, um, in this photograph. I will just take my pointer to show them to you. So, uh, interestingly enough, there are pencil traces all around her silhouette of the legs, and then also the, the little parts here of the shoes are all, when you see them in the, in, the good light, in, the re in the best light, then you see the pencil traces. So, for the moment, being we didn't know, for the very first moment, we didn't know um, what this meant. Look at the image again. It's completely unclear where this lady is sitting and how she is sitting. You do not see anything. So she's just like in the air. But if we look closely, we see maybe a leg of a chair going down here. So they have retouched the chair leg where she's sitting just to get her like flying. So looking closely at images can open us uh, a whole world. It's quite an abstract composition as you see. And the focus is very clearly on the legs and on the shoes. So probably in about two or three years, we will also have an exhibition on shoe design. I think it's so popular, you can do it the world around. We'll focus on 300 years of shoe design in Europe uh, in our exhibition. So uh, you might question yourself and ask yourself, why was this image made? Did it have a certain use? And you will see the use on the next slide. So Eva worked for an, advert an advertisement here. And you see the very same image used in this advertisement from 1932. This is why we know that it was done earlier. The pa textile pattern of the, of the silk stocking is here in the center. So it's really now good to be seen. The undulated form of this entire advertisement retakes a little bit the hairstyle of the period. The skirt, which we have seen, is cut out and re uh, repainted with just a line painting, a line uh, drawing, sorry, and much text has been added. And those who are able to read German, it's not the most intelligent text. This uh, stocking is a novelty called Matesa Matt, so a non-shiny silk stocking, which was produced in the town of Chemnitz, which is in middle Germany, about, about three hours by train from Berlin. So immediately when you see the advertisement, you wonder what is Chemnitz and what's about the industry there. So this would be another story we could follow, and I'm just really focusing now some of the stories possible to, to retrace. On the left-hand side, you see a book cover of a publication on the Chemnitz stocking industry, which was very intelligently done by combining archi architecture design, so um, facades from this uh, industrial town in middle Germany, and also the stocking patterns. Pattern. So when you see here the architecture, which is like expressionist style, and then also things like this. So they made a very, very good book, also um, bringing together artists and fashion historians. As you can read, uh, Chemnitz stocking industry, it was called the Manchester of Germany, of Saxony, more exactly. It was, until the 1940s, the biggest industry for this region and had then only a decline in the period of East Germany. So they really have been the biggest um, industry uh, in Germany in this field. Again, going back to my image, uh, we can now also open various other ways. We could ask ourselves, did Eva only work for stocking industry or fashion industry? No, she also did various advertisements. So I can show you some other images of this photographer. She worked a lot for perfume and beauty com companies, which was very much at, the, at fashion at that time. And we can learn a lot when we look at her images. So you see uh, on, on these both images are vintage prints from my collection. And then in the middle, you see another image of Eva used for advertisement. We can see we can learn about the practice, the advertising practice of this period. We can learn a lot about the aspects of economic history. And uh, so I, I'm always telling an image is as uh, rich in content as a real garment. So this is, you will understand my point of view. I'm curator of a collection of graphic images. Eva did also normal fashion photographs 
And for instance, we can could compare, um, well, fashionable poses of the 1920s and 30s in her photographs to other decades or other photographers. We could also go farther uh, in our interest concerning the role of photography and of fashion in Berlin during the 1930s. This is a very normal street view of Berlin in the 1930s um, next to the central station, 10 past 12. The photographer Seidenstücke was a photographer working often in town. They all liked then to go out with the new cameras, the smaller, smarter cameras, and to photograph, to do photographs of normal people. He showed really big interest in details of society and society life, and very often in his images you can see the dress codes of the period. So you see, also see the legs here, for instance. But the image also shows us, in comparison with Eva's uh, image, that the ladies are wearing longer dresses, longer skirts than the image in the photograph. We could also do, uh, go another way and for instance look at the modern image of women of this period. Here we can see on the left hand side a drawing. You see the reclining pose and how she is showing the shiny effect of the, of the stockings, also of the skin. This is also a drawing from our collection. Both image, images show us very long and exaggerated uh, legs. So for the fashion illustrator, it was very easy because she, can, she has an artistic freedom to do whatever she wants. Also in the photograph, Eva reached this effect very well. So many more stories could be discovered by detailed research, but I think we leave it here. As maybe you have understood from what I'm saying, I see my role in a fashion research center, let's say, in a costume library and graphic collection, more in stimulating new topics of research than really attracting students. They come with their teachers and then we are their partners, but we are not offering courses to students. We also want to help creative people to use our collections. Very often they are shy at the beginning and then after one or two days they do not want to leave. So they start very early in the morning and they spend all the time they spend in Berlin with us without going out in, in a city which certainly is also quite um, attractive. Sorry. Furthermore, uh, we try also, I try also yearly to curate, some, to curate exhibitions and to public the collection's highlights. So our traditional work is the normal museum work, but I'm very sure, as I said you before, I told you before, we have to go towards a few future use, and I'm sure that we will have very good opportunities via this project, via conferences, I'm quite well linked also with Berlin Fashion Week, which is still a baby compared to all the other cities, but uh, it's growing every year. Um, I'm happy also to be a board member of uh, two of the fashion awards um, in Germany. Uh, one person is also here, Joachim Schirmacher, speaking for the foundation of German fashion industry. So let's just come back. You have understood what I wanted to show you, so one object out of 250,000 with Eva's wonderful photograph. You could also read it in another way. We are only one person per task and confronting 250,000 objects, so I'm one curator, I have one librarian and one museologist to do the work. We are a team of three with some temporary helping. Now for Europeana we also have one person more, but it's always one and we always have to confront the big number of the, of the items. So um, international corporations are for us the most important thing. If I think back to times, let's say 30 years ago, when the curator before me was working there, it was so much compl more complicated, first of all, to get to Berlin, as we have been a, a, a city with a wall around. It also has been complicated without the, all the digital world, without internet. So communication today should really be used in the very best way. I'm not a big fan of uncontrolled communication. I think this is important to keep also in mind that also our heads have limits. I, our eyes also cannot um, devour everything and give a good result of it. 
but it can offer us the very best possibilities um, to go towards a good future. Thank you for your patience.